Hello and welcome to the Brown Sign Project. We have another exciting episode for you for today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a lovely lady called Elizabeth. Hello, Elizabeth. Hiya. How are you doing today? Good. Very excited that Christmas is um, just around the corner. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, Elizabeth, can you just tell us a little bit about you and what you do? Yeah, so um, I'm a Senior Visitor Experience Manager at a London attraction. Um, I've been in the industry for about nine years now. Um, and yeah, I started studying biology, so not your usual way into the heritage sector. Um, but I got really interested about museums doing an internship in my degree. And somehow this is where I've ended. Excellent. Brilliant. Our second, our second biology degree, I think. Uh, ah, Maybe right. our third, actually. I think it might be oh our gosh. third. I think it <laughs> That's might be a good our... hit rate. That's a good hit rate for biology, I'm going to say. I see a theme now, a, a theme. Excellent. Um, brilliant. So before we start, um, we need to get to know you a little bit better. I know you a little bit myself, but I don't think Carly does. So Carly's got no. questions that she's going to ask you. Um, and it's a little game called This or That. So Carly, over to you. So, yeah, so you don't have to, th it's not, it's not difficult. You should be able to answer them quite easily. Um, it just helps us to get, you know, know you a little bit better. Uh, so let's start with city or countryside? Countryside. Oh, winter or summer? Oh, can I say autumn? <laughs> um... oh, we might let you have that one. We might let you have autumn. Sort of in between. Um, hamburger or tacos? Uh, tacos. Oh, good, good choice. We've decided that if people say hamburger, there's there's no more podcast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's very the, true. That's very the end. true. <laughs> Ninjas or pirates? Uh, pirate. Book or ebook? Ebook, mm, because that's what I'm doing the most at the moment. Ah. Podcast or music? Music. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Um, uh, um, um, a day at a theme park or a day at the beach? Theme park, only because they happen so rarely for me nowadays. I, I miss them more. Oh, ah, okay. Well, we may be getting to that later on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, horror movies or comedies? Comedies, obviously, yeah. Oh, excellent. Cool. <laughs> I feel like I really I really understand you now. And I feel like, we, yeah, you can, you can stay on the podcast because you said tacos, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> excellent all right so elizabeth i've got your first question um for this podcast um so what does a normal day look like for you at work um at the moment um well i guess a normal day at work well like most operational jobs um my day really varies um so when i'm on site and i'm not being a duty manager so just doing my senior visitor experience manager role um, I get in about an hour before we open to the public, do some emails, write down what I need to achieve for the day, and then be in a coffee or a cup of tea with a colleague. Um, and then I normally go down and attend a team briefing if I haven't got any meetings. And then usually I might have anything between three to five meetings during the day. Sometimes it's intense because it's back to back, but um, it's usually like things like a one-to-one -one with one of my direct reports, meeting my own manager for a quick catch up and a couple of cross departmental meetings. So where I get to chat with other teams on things like the visitor experience, health and safety, or sometimes like recent projects like the virtual delivery group, which is a new group we've created in response to COVID time. So looking at what virtual content we create for our visitors digitally. Um, but I guess more often than not, I'm acting as a visitor operations representative. So trying to enable what the museum wants to deliver but also watching out for my team and the visitor interests as well um, and then usually the rest of the day is just doing emails impromptu conversations I find that uh, visitor experience teams are very very chatty and they need to talk a lot <laughs> and bounce ideas off each other and they like to share but um, yeah personally what I like to work the most on is things like uh, the roster you know, trying to fit the people into schedule and budget planning. I know it's boring, but I actually, anything that's a bit of a puzzle is my thing, really. Oh, yeah, you're a woman after my own heart. They were my favourite jobs when I was an ops manager, too. <laughs> I loved uh, anything that you, it's sort of very satisfying to feel like you've got those things under control. Exactly, yeah. Oh, oh give me a roster any day. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah 100%. Absolutely love it. 
Um, so because of COVID, um, so most of the attractions have literally closed down. So kind of how have you kind of balanced like working from home and maybe kind of going into work? How's that, how's that been for you? Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, so I work four days a week um, and what I'm trying to achieve is two days on site, two days at home. Um, I, I have a small daughter who's in nursery, so obviously I can't work when she's around. So I can only work from home if, she, if she's away. Um, when I'm at home, that's when I catch up on the bigger stuff where I need full concentration. Because as soon as I'm on site, um, a lot of people want to come and chat to me or they've got ideas or they've got feedback, especially now because we've changed our operations. So people want to discuss what we've changed and they want to bring their new ideas and obviously um, a few worries. So when I'm on site at the moment, I'm a bit more on the floor than I used to be. So sort of walking around, chatting to the team, making sure they feel safe um, with the COVID um, measures we've put in place. And then I usually have a bit of office time. Um, but also what's changed for me is I'm actually covering the floor, like as well covering people's breaks, which I, I didn't have to do for a very long time. But um, with the changes, we've had to all sort of um, chip in a bit more than we used to. Do you find that that's... Because um, I used to do that a lot, of, again, when I was managing a team. And actually, it, it sort of feels a, a bit weird at first, but I found that it really helped me sort of understand the floor a lot more as to what you know what the team were seeing if you if you've been enjoying that that more time sort of doing that frontline position yeah it, it's mixed it was mixed feelings at first um <laughs> I was a uh, I did frontline for about two and a half years um before sort of moving up into management and um mm. there's bits that you enjoy and bits that you enjoy less um so I was a bit unsure how I'd be a bit sort of um you know, was I going to remember how to make the till function and all that kind of stuff? But actually on Sunday, just last Sunday, I was um, a relief shift. So I covered them um, four hours worth of lunch breaks. And um, it was amazing just to talk to visitors again. Like, I really, really enjoyed it, especially coming in. Um, and it was really lovely saying hello to them, explaining how the museum was going to work. And then actually on their way out, being able to be there and say, did you enjoy, you know, the ride? Did you enjoy you know you have a good time and um, so yeah I really really enjoyed it um more than I thought I had yeah more than I thought I would I guess that's awesome yeah I think there's that that you you miss that a bit when you get and I don't think you Absolutely. take it sort of for granted when you work those jobs that that that's how your life is and it's not until you stop doing it that you realise how much you miss the general public, even at the moment, <laughs> when yeah, the general public are quite difficult. <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely agree with it. Um, you, you sort of leave those jobs thinking, you know, especially with customer service, it can be, it can be, it can be a hard job sometimes, you know, when mm. there's difficult messages or um, difficult customers. Um, but actually, you do miss that interaction. And I used to deliver a lot of tours as a host. And um even though I got a bit nervous before delivering them, I really missed that a lot from my old job, you know, just writing, content, delivering, getting people asking me questions. Um, yeah, you do miss it, definitely. Excellent. So I guess that, that brings us nicely into uh, my next question, which is what was your most memorable day at work? What, what's the stuff that sticks with you? Uh, um, well, there's been a few in my last nine years or so, um, but I guess if I have to pick a couple, um, the most recent one was the opening of the Postal Museum, which is my current place of work. Um, we opened in the summer of 2017 and it was a crazy day. Some of us started working at um, four o'clock in the morning, facilitate a visit from BBC Breakfast. And then straight after 10, we were open to the public until five o'clock um, and then followed by some late night TV interviews. So one of the longest shift work one of my managers was 4 a.m to 9 p.m so it was quite a long day um and we had a couple of sort of predicted setbacks basically the the train ride at the postal museum and it wasn't ready for opening we had a couple of confused visitors um even though we put the messaging out there but overall it was an amazing day just to see a long project finally being delivered and seeing the awesome team we just recruited and trained you know they were putting into practice all the training that we'd given them and them deliver a strong customer service from the get-go was really rewarding um so that was a really positive if crazy that's, day 
Yeah, that's awesome. I think there's not many things and it's hard to explain if you've never if you've never been there for an opening or a, even a seasonal opening, because it's definitely feels like sort of a birth. You know, everybody's yes. really excited and but exhausted <laughs> also, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and and the 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 adrenaline carries you through. But you go home and you sleep really well, <laughs> usually. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. It, it it's an indescribable thing opening especially like you know the longer you've been working on the project and and um, the more intense it might have been there was various challenges with the project so it was just amazing to, even though it was only half an opening because of the ride but it was just really good to just uh, finally be open and it just felt like a really it was, it was great it was a, a an amazing experience and I definitely recommend anyone who's got the um opportunity to be part of an opening uh, attraction to, to go for it because it has its challenges but you're the first team and, and nothing sort of changes that really yeah you sort of have a special place in the organization after that this you'll always be the the someone that was there on day one um so you said that was one of your um yes. <laughs> please tell us your second one I, I'm I, intrigued <laughs> my second one was when I was um uh, freshly a uh, new uh, duty manager at my previous job in London. I remember it so vividly because potentially I was slightly terrified that day, but it was simultaneously the opening of our Christmas Grotto and the new paid exhibition, which I think was um, Dickens in London on the weekend. So there was no senior staff in because it was a weekend. Um, opening the Christmas Grotto was always a bit of a challenge because people have such high expectations to see Santa. Um, they they have been I think for us the most happiest but also the most difficult customers in any kind of experience in any attraction we've worked in and obviously a new Tempe exhibition there's always things like I don't know scanners not working or you know that kind of thing so um it was a difficult weekend but, um, the fire alarm went off and it just didn't stop <laughs> so um it was because of construction works outside and the dust kept coming into our sensors and um that with the public outside for a couple of hours in a cold December obviously kids crying because they wanted to see Santa not we weren't sure if we'd be able to fit them in because we'd sold out um but in the end we managed and um, we um, as a new duty manager it was certainly a bit of a baptism of fire for me <laughs> yeah there's nothing like a, a good uh hard day of the, <laughs> of the office is there <laughs> but yeah fire alarms I think we've all had those oh, days <laughs> I think that's just standard to be honest you know you're just waiting for that on, on the day just like oh, is it fine I'm gonna go off today maybe maybe not you know it's all good it was just the culmination of all three elements together I think which was just... oh yeah the, the, oh, yeah the fire alarm never goes off when when you're having a quiet day <laughs> no, no, no. No, no 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 that's too easy that's too easy you need some ex- excitement and some drama <laughs> yeah in your day you know but it's all good so Elizabeth, you've you've worked in the industry for for nine years, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um. So, what do you think are the most important skills that people need to pick up to kind of like join the industry? So, from the visit experience operations um, perspective, I guess there's quite a few roles within just that area. Like, you know, you could be a host, you could be working as an administrator, as a duty manager. I guess the first point is don't assume you need a degree in history or archaeology. Um, academics don't always make the best, you know, host, tour guides, duty managers. Um, and don't assume you need a degree. I mean, I've recruited people from all walks of life in our host and duty manager teams. who have been great colleagues and who've had a lot to contribute to the operation. So generally, I'd say most of the people, you know, have got degrees, but not all of them. So I wouldn't want people to feel ever put off by that, really. Um, I guess the other thing in terms of essential skills, people skills are really important. So not being afraid to approach people, not taking it personally if people aren't interested. You know, if you have to sell a guidebook and they say no, don't take it personally. Um, And just being confident in customer service delivery, I guess. It doesn't mean you need to know everything, but being confident in knowing where to find the answer makes a difference into um, your interaction with the customer. So that and trying to go above and beyond uh, the visitor's expectation. Um, and then just generally, I guess, I don't know, things like, you know, good platform skills or presentation skills, you know, being some bit of a storyteller, you know, trying to engage the visitor. It doesn't matter what role, you know, you'll, you'll always see visitors 
whether you're on the floor permanently or whether you're on the floor every now and then, you know, being able to give a small bite-sized fact, you know, that they'll remember for life, I think that makes a big difference. And then there's usually the ones you see on job descriptions that sometimes are a bit buzzwordy, but I personally feel they're really essential for you to enjoy the job, not just to do the job, but to enjoy it. So, you know, flexible, proactive, can-do approach, you always see those words. And I think a lot of people feel they embody those traits, but as a manager, I can tell you that those who really do embody them shine above the rest. Um, you know, duty managers would always be grateful for team members who can problem solve situations and, you know, already come up with a solution to a, a challenge. And um, I think when you have those, those, those skills or those behaviours, then ultimately, you know, you might get rewarded by things like side projects or you know people will have you they'll bear you in mind for things and then um, if if you want to move up within an organization it's it's worth bearing that in mind I think yeah I think as a duty manager my my preference was always if somebody called me to you know a, a situation that needed dealing with that if they already had an idea as to what they would do and you know then you can just empower your staff to do it and you say well yeah, okay well exactly. next time you don't even need to call me tell me afterwards you know tell me what you you did and and if you need help i'm always going to come and help you but actually it's so much nicer when the, the 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 person gets to be able to do it themselves feels really empowered to do that and it does work both ways you know that feel free yeah. to sort of you know put your ideas forward and and say well this is how i would have approached it and you know let your team do what they do best serve your customers yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, you know, that was always when, when I created the new team in, in my last job, um, the host role, and that's definitely what I wanted to achieve, you know, that they could basically deal with most of it themselves. Um, mm -hmm. They felt empowered to do that. And, you know, that when they called us down for a complaint, that, you know, they'd already tried to uh, address it and not just sort of the manager down. Um, yeah. And the team we've got, I have to say, they're quite, they are quite independent and they always, they always then propose them feedback and ideas and they, they overall have a um, quite open relationship with the manager. They do talk to them a lot, which is, which is really good because that's important, I think, to me. Um, yeah, and I guess, yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely those skills I think are, are sort of essential but like I said also so that you can actually enjoy the job because for example if you don't like change and you feel uncomfortable with things changing frequently then a job in operations might you might not enjoy it as much I guess. Yeah I think for, for those of us who thrive in operations who thrive on change and who thrive on a challenge yeah. it, it, you, it's difficult to understand when somebody doesn't and, you know, I can't think of anything worse than being somebody who really doesn't thrive in those situations and being put in those situations. So, if, you know, I think as a as a kind of tip for people listening, if you if you think actually this job isn't for me and you've tried, it, it also is a very specific thing to be able to to take those things head on. Change, you know, isn't everybody's favorite. <laughs> Rising to a challenge isn't everybody's favorite. But for those who do. I think it's a you know it's this it's a great industry to be in because it's it's very challenging at times. Yeah, yeah. I definitely um, definitely I was going to kind of jump in on that. I mean, Elizabeth, you mentioned something about pe um, being a people's person, and and I think that's key as well in um, making sure if you want to come and work in the tourist attractions industry, you need to at least like people, um, and that might be a stupid thing to say, but. Um, we're all about hospitality and making sure everyone has the best time and best experience possible. And, and as you've mentioned, Elizabeth, you know, you've created your team to be independent, to, to, to deliver that service, um, which is so, so important. So no, thank you so much for sharing that, that point. Yeah. I've met um, a few people in the, in the service industry that you think, I'm not sure you were, you got the memo that this is an <laughs> industry of service, you know, <laughs> You really do have to 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 want to serve the public, I think, in this role. And if if that's yeah. not your goal, you you probably you know need to maybe think about moving out of the a front line role at least. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. But also, you know, um, especially if you're going to work like backup office, like in marketing or finance, you still need these people skills. 
Oh yes. yeah. You know, yeah. so um, if you don't have that, then I think maybe you need to think about another career. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what other career you could do if you really dislike people. But I'm sure there's. I'm sure there are some auditing. People, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Auditing. People, people can can tweet us and write in and tell us <laughs> what jobs they think you can do without any service skills. <laughs> Well, I'm interested to see. Me too, me too. <laughs> um, so thinking about um, that then, what, what do you think are the, the things that we're looking for sort of three top tips for if you do want to get ahead in this industry, you know, if you do want to see yourself in a, in a promotion or progressing, what do you think the, the important skills are for, for, those, um, for those people who are looking for that? Um. I guess my top three would probably change depending on what stage of your life and career you're at. But um, yeah, I guess my general ones are be interested in your sector outside the attraction you work at. So, you know, follow front of house or visit experience groups on social media like LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, name a few. Um, being on the pulse of what's happening. Um, there's some great Twitter accounts and I, can, I quite like Museum Hour, which is, I think, on Mondays and they just have a topic that could range from something visit experience but also things like I don't know how we interpret um, collections so it's nice to sort of know what other people in the sector are thinking and there's a FOH museum one as well which is specifically about front of house issues um, so yeah so just don't be interested in your museum but have a look at what the rest of the sector is doing or attraction. The second I guess is cultivating your network um, I know that like when you start moving into management and stuff, sometimes networking can be really awkward, but I think it's really worth it. Um, I'm lucky to have attended a few sort of visit experience forum meetings and workshops over the last six years or so. And it's just been great to share experiences, ideas and woes sometimes with like, -mind, uh, like minded colleagues. Sometimes I guess it can be a bit lonely when you're the only manager in the role. So it's nice to talk to people outside of your own attraction. Um, and sharing ideas and, you know, being able to tell your management team what other visitor experience or front of house teams are doing. Sometimes it even gives you more clout to your arguments when you're trying to change a process. If you can say, well, you know, this other place is doing the same thing or this other place has explored this idea, but it didn't work for them because. Um, so, yeah, definitely cultivate your network. And then uh, self-development. Um, I guess. You don't need to wait for your organisation to put you on a training course to learn something new. Um, I used to constantly <laughs> wait for, um, oh, can I go on this training course? And, and, I, and it would never happen because of, you know, finances and stuff like that. But then there's lots of other things you can do. Um, you know, reading a lot, loads of useful management books um, or people skill books you can read, which help, you know, get a fresh perspective. Or even TED Talks as well, if you don't like reading, it can be quite good. Um, you can also suggest an exchange with another attraction or organisation. So, for example, you can go and shadow someone else and then they can come over and shadow you. It's a really cheap way of having some time away from site and getting a fresh perspective on things and, you know, making building relationships outside of your attraction. Um, but you could do that internally as well, I guess. You know, if you wanted to go into learning or curatorial, but, you know, you're in visit experience, you can also... Um, asked to spend some time with another team and my guess I have got free time to court resource for people who've got children um, but there's lots of free and paid online resources um, and courses to feed your brain with especially since Covid I found you know um, things like the Open University has some free heritage courses you can do so yeah so that's a bit of a long answer but there are, no, yeah. no it was a really good answer and I think you're you're right I think that we the thing that has come out for us around the you know good things from the coronavirus and I hate sort of saying good things from the coronavirus because it's clearly not a good thing in in many many respects um but is that actually how much content has been produced oh, and yeah. really democratized you know there's so much more free content than there ever has been um and you know you conferences that are put online webinars that are put online that you would have had to travel to before you would have had to pay to stay overnight so it's really hopefully opened up a lot of opportunity for for people to to really get into yeah. that absolutely I think I think and that you know that's like, you know, like a good thing of being on furlough for some people have been they really you know taken that opportunity to really um you know 
self-develop obviously it's not for everyone and there's lots of you know mental health challenges associated with you know being in lockdown and stuff but I think for some people it's been really beneficial you know the stuff's out there if you if you can go out and grab it then it is there for the taking um yeah yeah I think there was there was something else you said that I found really interesting around networking um and it made me think actually that you know about not being confident networking when you're younger and I found it a real struggle and I'm I'm really extroverted so like you know that networking for me is is not an issue but I think when you are younger you your friendships and the people that you meet are sort of thrust upon you because you go to school you go to college you go to university you know you your your parents know people and you know you hang around with with the people that live on your street and that kind of thing yeah um but and you sort of don't realize that that's a skill that you're developing it and I really think, is, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then when you get older you sort of think oh God, you know you don't have those natural sort of thrust together situations unless you join a new job or something like that and I think w- what people fail to realize is when they say oh I struggle to make friends when I'm older it's because you're not really trying <laughs> because mm-hmm. you you've sort of you've always had that experience of oh, well I've never tried to make friends networking is just trying to make connections with people build relationships and I yeah. think yeah that that that's such an important part if you can crack it early to to find out what it is that that allows you to do that then that's a really great skill to have and practice makes perfect it genuinely does like it's it's not you know you might not naturally feel that you're good at it but it is something that's actually easy to improve on um I yeah think it's something that you just yeah. need to keep doing um do you know what? I'm so glad that you mentioned practice make perfect um and i mean what people can do is maybe maybe go on youtube and try and figure out like find like how to network and um even like um voice coaching or something like that if they feel feel like your voice doesn't sound right you know there are loads of resources out there for free that you can use to develop yourself but you need to have that mentality and um that drive to do it you know no one's going to do it for you you're the only one who can do it so yeah and sometimes it can be the hardest thing of all I think like person speaking personally like if I'm not doing something it's always because of a mental block in my head and you just always have to try and find a way of breaking through really because like you said no one's going to do it for you no one's going to get you the next job up you know yeah it's all down to you really yeah totally agree so kind of like picking back on on what you've mentioned um this is kind of one of my favorite questions to ask and it's what is the best um, career advice you've received during your career so show your interest um it sounds simple but I think sometimes we don't always want to of our managers because they might be busy or you might not want to contact someone from an external organization because you don't want to bother them or you make assumptions there might not be time money to do certain things you've got in mind um so to give some examples of where I've had to show interest there was one specific scenario where if I hadn't shown interest my whole career could have gone a different way um, and that's when I was a host. Um, it'd been the trial of a um, host duty manager role which is a role where you're mainly a host but occasionally you step up to be a duty manager. And they'd done it for six months and then sort of stopped it and I assumed that management didn't want it to continue um, because it stopped um, and some of the managers had left which meant the duty management team was quite understaffed, Christmas was coming up so I grabbed one of the managers and said, you should consider, you know, relaunching the program again. You're going to need help. And I'd like to help with that. And then, you know, just three weeks later, suddenly I was starting training to be a duty manager. And had I not asked then and there, I would have had to wait another nine months before the next opportunity was opened up to the whole team. So it was really just because I grabbed a manager in the corridor and mentioned it, that I got that opportunity and, and actually went into the experience management. Um, and another example as well, where people told me, you know, show your interest was applying for jobs for the next level up um, and doing that before I was ready for the role. So on both occasions, I went for um, an assistant visitor experience manager role and uh, later on the visitor experience manager. Job. Um, I knew I wasn't quite ready yet, but I wanted to show that I was interested and motivated and, you know, it was definitely on my career path. And both times I didn't get the first time round, but the panel felt I had potential and they gave me some really meaty projects so that I was able to 
in the experience that was either missing um, or learn, you know, learn new skills and, and shine in in something. Um, and then on both occasions, it helped me secure the job the next time around. So even, yeah, it's just always worth showing basically manage, managers internally, but also externally that you're interested. Yeah, I really, I really like that idea as well of, you know, applying before you're ready. And you obviously, you know, don't, if it's an internal application, that's a little bit safer. You know, if it's in the same business Correct. or whatever, don't, don't, don't be wasting, you know, all your time and, and other people's time on applying for things that you, you have really Correct. have no hope in getting. <laughs> but I've, I had a similar thing in, uh, quite early on in my career was I wanted to be an ops manager and, and I, you know, I, I wasn't really ready for it. But I went along to an interview that I, I, I knew I wasn't going to get, you know, it was 100%. This was not the job for me. Um, it was in the wrong location and, and all this stuff. But after, actually off the back of that, about two months later, because they'd hired up in the company, their job became available. And they said, well, you know, actually, would you like to come and try for this job as well? And sometimes you just hear about things because like you say, you've shown your interest. And exactly. it's a really nice way to sort of flag yourself as, as a potential candidate for other things. No, exactly. Like, and, and again, you know, like with the networking, it's not stuff that I necessarily felt comfortable doing. I had to really, you know, gird all my loins and, and approach, you know, I wasn't, I, I'd be lying so much, I was very confident doing it, but it was definitely worth it in every every single time I did it. And you're right, the, the jobs I went for, most of uh, those two were, were internal, so I knew it was, it was safe. So, and I knew I'd get feedback and, and stuff. So, but yeah, like no regrets. Yeah, and I, I think as well, I, I've had a, 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 I've probably told this story before actually a little bit, but um, I once went for a job interview that I was in nowhere near qualified for. It was, you know, maybe three times the salary I was on at the time. <laughs> and it was a really a big job. And I thought, well, I'm going to apply for it because it, it just sounds interesting. And I had the skills, but at a much smaller, smaller site. And actually, when I arrived, I knew more about the job interview than I thought I did. And I actually got through to the last two. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, Amazing. And, I, and just because actually, you don't know, sometimes you might no. think, well, I have those skills, but I'm maybe not that confident about it. But actually, that might be everyone else in the room with you. Everyone yeah. else might be in the same position. So yeah, I think sometimes right. just, just go for it. <laughs> Yeah. And then beg beg forgiveness afterwards, but have your reasons ready. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Excellent. So I think we are at the end of our questions. Is there anything else that you want to talk about, Elizabeth, that we haven't covered that you you desperately want to share with our our uh, listeners? I think it's just a, a an amazing sector to work in, and um, you know, I I really didn't think I was going to go that direction at all um I oh, think oh so that that does bring me to one last question before yes. before you wrap up is what did you think you were going to do with your biology degree <laughs> what was your plan so my biology degree was actually environmental biology um and I wanted to go and save the world put it simply um, <laughs> but um unfortunately when I graduated I think it was 2017 there was a sort of a mini crash and um environmental jobs were either paid abysmally and I'm talking you know 12 13,000 a year or it was mainly volunteering um and um I had to think something different and and I did um a master's degree in science communication which gave me an internship at the natural history museum where I was researching um biological facts um but it made me consider uh museums as a as an option um, and so what I wanted to do was interpretation development, which is basically where you research content for the galleries and exhibitions. Um, and again, it was just the wrong time career wise. Everyone wanted people with lots of years of experience. No one was taking on anyone new at the job at the time. So I just um, went for a host job and thought I'd work my way up. But um, um, I found that I really liked problem solving and um, fixing things like briefing sheets that were all wrong and and um, trying to do processes and systems that previous duty managers couldn't quite work out and um, you know I just thought I just want a bit of extra money I'll be a duty manager give me a bit of extra money but then actually I just really really enjoyed it and it was something that I found I was good at so yeah, I think sometimes it's really nice to just find what you're good at but you, you don't you can't always predict it you really can't there's just so many jobs out there it's impossible to know 
know what you can do or what you're going to be good at because what you might want to do might not be actually something you're good at anyway but you don't know that until you sort of try different things yeah i think yeah. we we can uh, especially carton and i yes. we we both uh, yeah and, and most people that we speak to sort of fall into the industry thinking oh you know i'll i'll do something else once i've this has tidied me over exactly. and actually have never left and and love it so <laughs> it's yeah. definitely a, a, a common um, occurrence I, th I think I've got a little top tip um, regarding what you're saying Elizabeth um, what's really really good is to do like a personality test um, yeah. get them free online um, not, at, not that however I will caveat that with not the government jobs test <laughs> no not that one um, there's the, other... the famous government jobs test no don't, let's, let's not go down that road um and, and that's quite good to kind of give you kind of an idea of, of what sort of, sort of personality type you are and what sort of jobs fits your personality. And that's something that I would, would have loved to have done earlier in my career, because I think that would have fast tracked me to where I am today, if that makes sense. Um, because it, it was kind of like, like a maze. You're kind of trying different stuff and going down different routes and maybe you hit like a, a dead end. You, you have to go back and then go to another route and then, that kind of stuff but if i had that information in in, in the few in the, in the in the future um i think it would have helped me a lot so yeah yeah i absolutely recommend um that we do two tests we do one that's based on the myers-briggs that's free online and one that's based on them whether you're red blue green whether you're driven by people systems or results and every time i have someone new joining either the team leaders or the business experience managers we all do them again because I think it really helps show um, how, as a team, having different, you might be different people and it might have be a source of conflict sometimes, the ways of working, but actually every characteristic, every behavior, every style of working has a place to be. But obviously like some, um, some jobs attract people with certain skill sets more than others or certain behaviors more than others. But I completely agree. Some of those, it, sometimes it feels a bit cliche, those, because they're sort of putting you into the box, but sometimes they can be really eye opening. Um, and in the past, I found them useful to um, use the words, um, describe myself, you know, at the beginning of a CV or, you know, when I'm writing an application, sometimes those tests give you some sentences that are like perfect to describe you. And I found that really useful as well. Yeah, no, yeah I think, yeah, that kind of self knowledge uh, is is really vital I think to understand what your strengths and your weaknesses are and that's a hard for thing to, to get through you know sometimes it's uncomfortable um yeah. I remember the first time I did it and I mean I will I will own up and I've always been me if you like I've always had quite a strong sense of personality and um but I am not a complete a finisher if you've ever done Myers-Briggs that is not, that's not my thing and um yeah, and I've, yeah. I've really had to sort of come to terms with that and you know I would love to be it would be my dream to be someone who could finish a job once they've started it. But no, that is not, that's not my, my skill. Yeah. skill. <laughs> I'm exactly like you. That is my big weak area as a computer finisher. I'm great at, you know, um, investigating what resources we need, planning who's going to do what, but then I lose interest. Once I've launched something, like I sort of lose interest and I struggle to sort of finish off the last, the last page of a document or, you know, yeah, I can, yeah, I'm on <laughs> yeah it's hard it's hard reading sometimes but i I've, I've come to terms with it <laughs> I, I know how you feel um elizabeth thank you so much for taking your time um to speak to us today it's you've just given us some fun. fantastic insights on there so if people want to find you where can they find you online really so um my full name is elizabeth pillian um it's not either um, and I'm happy to chat, um, you know, give advice or, or um, yeah, share some thoughts. So, yeah, LinkedIn is the easiest one, definitely. Awesome. So you can find Elizabeth on LinkedIn. Um, and that's it. Thank you again for taking this time and chatting with us. Um, and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, Elizabeth. Bye. Bye. Bye.